uncovering Bloomgate inside the world's largest provable cover-up. This is by Patrick Penry. Fear and the loathing on Fukushima Unit 4. The trick to convince the American people, indeed the world, and the worst of the worst has not already happened at Fukushima. Even if that means media campaign a fear-mongering based around a fantasy doomsday scenario involving the collapse of Unit 4, its spent fuel pool. Interestingly enough, all the alternative and mainstream media outlets that are promoting the bogus Unit 4 doomsday scenario are the same ones chosen not to report on the Nuclear Regulatory Agency's Freedom of Information Act documents pertaining to Fukushima. The documents tell the true story of Fukushima, the multi-agency cover-up that downplayed and concealed the radioactive plume and fallout, the reality of a prolonged station blackout that produced three China Syndrome meltdowns, and the Unit 4 spent fuel pool zirconium fire and subsequent melt on the floor of the fuel rods. The sad reality is that the effects of a nuclear plant meltdown or spent fuel pool fire can be sudden and so severe that the possibility exists that no safety precautions can be taken quickly enough to avoid the consequences completely. In the case of the Fukushima catastrophe, it took about a week to produce a measurable plume that traveled south, down the coast, and then swept inland across Tokyo. These plumes were laden with aerosol plutonium. How do you evacuate a city of Tokyo of over 20 million people in less than a week? How will we evacuate New York if Indian Point has an accident and produces a plume? Where do you relocate a city of millions of people? So you see, the reality of a potential meltdown or meltdowns is so horrific, it must be hidden from the public at all costs. And when a meltdown does occur, the truth of its severity and its effects must also be hidden from the public at all costs. Can you imagine what it had been like at TEPCO, the government of Japan, the NRC, and the White House? had been upfront and 100% honest about the disaster from the start? What would have happened if officials announced that 1. a plutonium laden plume was driving towards Tokyo and 2. multiple plumes and fallout were heading across the Pacific towards the west coast of the US? What would have happened if officials were upfront and honest about the triple China syndrome and uniform melts on the floor and its effects? No matter how you slice it, it'd be very very ugly. And probably most likely all the nuclear plants would have been shut down in the United States. Heaven forbid, huh? Furthermore, how can one have a rational discussion about national security if one does not include a frank, open discussion about the decommissioning of all nuclear plants, which is a greater threat to the American public than Iran's nuclear program or our own nuclear program? Why would Iran build a nuclear bomb to use against the U.S. when we have hundreds of stationary bombs in the form of reactors and fuel pools already positioned throughout the country with incredible payloads far beyond the capacity of any bomb or missile? You take one reactor, it could make about 800 nuclear warheads. Think of the possibility of terrorist attacks, sabotage, earthquakes, tsunami, flooding from a broken dam upriver, or even the old-fashioned accident that aging reactors are bound to have from time to time. Why do we leave ourselves so vulnerable? About the Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool, the evidence from the NRC FOIA documents pertaining to Fukushima has led me to believe that 1. March 11, 2011 earthquake caused immediate structural damage to Unit 4 buildings. Spent fuel pool coolant began to drain out through the cracks or cracks that were resulted the earthquake. And TEPCO is saying that the earthquake did not cause any failure, it was the tsunami. Number two, there was an hydrogen explosion and a wall of walls of the spent fuel pool four were blown out. Exhibit number three, on March 15, 2011, the hot offload of fuel experienced a zirconium cladding fire and subsequent meltdowns to the floor of the spent fuel pool. According to the IAEA, spent fuel pool number four was on fire emitting radiation directly into the atmosphere for at least 9 hours and 10 minutes before TEPCO claimed it was extinguished. Number 4. 75% or more of the radiation contained in spent fuel pool 4 may have been released into the atmosphere. Modeling was done on a 100% release. Any fuel rods recovered, official numbers vary on what the inventory was, will be ones that were unused and cool, probably less than 25% of the inventory. It is possible that all the fuel rods were affected. We've been doing some brainstorming here, trying to figure out if they really lost integrity on Unit 3 and 4 spent fuel pools. The structural people are saying there's really no use to put water on there anymore because all you're going to do is spread the contamination. 
As it steams, you're going to make the contamination worse. This is Chuck. I think they only have one spent fuel pool that's lost geometry, right? And lost structure. Skiing? Yes, Unit 4. We think they lost. Blew the wall out of the side of the spent fuel pool. Gas though? But the other ones? If we could put water in them, you still would want to put water in them, wouldn't you? Somebody that was participating. Yes, if we can get water in them, they still are trying to even do that as we speak now, but are unable to do it. As far as we know, the other three will hold water. If we can get it in there to some extent, one of them, they said, seismically might be cracked, but we don't know that. David Skeen? Right. But again, if it's been dry this long, if they had that Zerk fire and it's already the fuel pool, you know, that was in there, by putting water in there and steaming it, all you're going to do is spread the contamination with the steam at some point. Casto? Yes, but like I said, Dave, Let's go both paths. Let's do a water path and a sand path. Skeen, I agree. You have to be ready to do both things. And we have to assume that, that one and two are headed the same way. Eventually, we will have to do sand there. Castle, right, you're right. Let's go ahead and do both solution paths. So recommend one and two water, three and four, since they had a Zerk water reaction to do something different. So this is their best plan was sand and water and they couldn't even use regular water they used a corrosive seawater there should be a desalination plant near every new plant so this is telling me yes and there's probably just drop sand and try to shield they're trying to cut down those at this point so you're just trying to cover up that rubble that's left now did you read the new reg I know you read the new reg Dave about putting water on the molten fuel that it can help they still recommend it, Dave said, right? Castle, it depends on how you do it, you know. Skeen, yes. Castle, go about spreading it. And uh, also, it depends on where there is a crust built up. Skeen, that's right. Right, because you're insulating the rubble too. So the heat is going to build up and it's going to last longer. But at some point, you have to figure out what's worse. To let the thing be hot and burn a little longer even if the shield is insulated or is it worse to spread more contamination so that's the kind of line you gotta walk to try to figure it out and so the concern the Japanese had was how are we gonna get this fresh water in there they were concerned that they couldn't access the reactor because of the high dose rates and so they asked us if we had any ideas on how they might reduce those rates in order to get closer maybe try to access the primary system to get some fresh water and supplies Although we still don't know if they even have any fresh water supplies that are available. Should they get access, I've asked the question of Chuck to find out because they are injecting seawater into the reactor. And the real question is, where are they getting the seawater from? Obviously from the sea. But you can only do what you can do. So we're also, you know, trying to figure out how to drop the dose rate so that, you know, people can install pumping systems or whatever strategy we have. So, you know, we are really trying to work that out and we're trying to decide whether, you know, to put lead in there or to put, you know, sand or to get the dose rates down. The big question, you know, you really don't want to put anything around the fuel, so you got to keep it cool. But what's left of it or whatever is there. Keep it coolable, but you've got to get the dose rate down. That's the kind of challenge now. You know, we're thinking Humvees for workers, you know, to transit in there to pipe and some shielding, some mechanisms to shield the workers. But some of these, you know, these are lethal dose rates. They're getting outside this building. Now what they're doing is they have bulldozers. I mean, the dose sounds like not as much as shine from the building as when the building blew up. There is spent fuel and pellets and whatever all over the place around the plant. So they are taking the bulldozers through and pushing the rubble in piles and they're saying that's cutting the dose down you know about 60 to 70 percent. So they're trying to in these areas where the piping runs will go they're trying to clean it up but I mean the dose is still going to be you know incredible. I mean we're talking yesterday they said the resources they have were somewhere between two to 300 people and that you know TEPCO and other licenses the Civil Defense Force and some police. Mr. Vallejo, 
the one thing about this is that we continue to hear from Chuck that the Chinese, I mean the Japanese, don't have much of an appetite for that approach. That they still believe that the water cannons and the helicopter dumping buckets of water on top of the units is a better strategy. And you know, we're assuming that they don't want to accept the dose that comes with hooking up this equipment. Oh, Brian said. Mr. Vallejo. So although the pumps are on site and Bechtel, in combination with our reactor safety teams, has sort of sketched it out, you know how one would hook up the pumps to get the head necessary to provide water to the spent fuel pools? We are not getting any takers from the Japanese side of this equation. I was wondering, is there anywhere we have like dose rates maps on site so that we cast though? I think we have that somewhere, yes, I think we do. And it's bad. Jack, between the units, I remember some numbers between units 2 and 3. The buildings, it's between 450 to 600 rem. So you're talking about lethal doses here. Oh, certainly. Right now, whether that's, you know, modulizing the construction and flying it on a helicopter, as much as you can modulize it and flying it in, we have people to go in and ball it up. That's the question. If you could get some kind of nozzle that goes into the spent fuel pool out the side of the floor, down the wall of the building, and then it has an elbow that goes down toward the ocean. Have that as a piece and hang that off a building on a helicopter, and then bring in another piece, lay it down towards the ocean, another straight piece of pipe, and another and another until you get it out to the ocean and then you've got to have some poor people running in there and bolt it up in a Humvee. We suggested to them last night yesterday that they get some Humvees and strap lead to the Humvees like they strap metal and order the Humvee itself. I don't know how much shielding a Humvee gives but put lead on a Humvee because one of the things is they're getting all that dose and that transit time to get the job to and from. Okay go ahead. Casto? I think maybe I told you. I can't remember exactly what I all told you. But the water drops don't seem to be effective. The dose rates were not altered at all. You probably already know that. Yeah, we're watching them on TV. And I can imagine they are not being very effective. You know that stuff they're doing. You know, initially the fire trucks and now. Then they had the riot spray pumps. And then yesterday, you know, probably about 36 hours ago. They brought in that airport super high capacity remote unmanned pumper truck. Brian? Yeah. Moniker? And also that the helicopters, all those systems are really not highly effective. They're actually just marginally effective. And you know the problem is, I mean, we're shooting from so far away, you have incredible losses. Right. Moniker? So that's so, that's all. So yes, we've been concerned with Unifor all along. Jim Wiggins. Okay, speaking of deposition and things like that, couple news. We got, we reached agreement with NARAC on what, let me also say, the president's source term. The one that, you know, you had agreed to. Jazzco? Yes. Wiggins? And it's, it's been a bit challenging to get runs from NARAC, but we understand that running those now. Jazzco? Okay. Wiggins and you know it took some cajoling with them they had some issues with how the source term was stated Jasco okay Wiggins but again I've seen they've agreed to run it Jasco okay good and remind me again what that is at this point there's been so many back and forth on this Wiggins yeah, I know, you know, I still won't let anybody use the word worst case in the room here. Chairman Jasko? Yeah. Jim Wiggins? Because there's about five worst cases. Jasko? Right. Jim Wiggins? What? What's the, the president's case? It's it's bounding. It includes the, the fuel in the three reactors. The fuel in the four spent fuel pools. It does not include the common spent fuel pool around Unit 4, nor reactors 5 and 6 or any spent fuel pools there. And it's assumed a release based over a 4 to 5 day period. 